Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie creator interview. It's your Caper Sarah Cody, and we're keeping it geekly with our two returning guests, Tim Rad Radecki, excuse me, and Mike Dean. We're here to break down the last house on Gallows Hill and everything in between. Last time we had you two on was for the Grave Brigade. Uh, how, how have you guys been since? I feel like it's been what, like two or three months? Hey, Cody, thanks for having us on. Yeah, it's been, it's been uh, a hectic two or three months at that. Uh, <laughs> the Kickstarter went well for us. Uh, we've been in fulfillment, uh, getting those packages out to everybody. So working on that and uh, here with another project. That yeah. is awesome. So for anyone who is tuning in for the first time, let's go ahead and just kind of reintroduce who you two are. Micah, we'll, we'll start with you if uh, you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Mike Dean, um, co-writer with uh, of Tim's, and um, I do uh, film and comics. And uh, yeah, thank you again for having us on, Cody. Absolutely. And Tim, uh, what about you? Yeah, so uh, Mike and I do a comic called Superbud. That was our first comic out there. That's an action comedy uh, about a stoner with superpowers. Uh <laughs> Medical marijuana it breaks out into this small town, starts giving people superpowers, and uh, hijinks ensue there. So that was our first book. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, Cody, we just wrapped up the first issue of Grape Brigade, our uh, second book. Uh, that one is uh, Nazi Monster Hunters. So uh, U.S. soldiers hunting Nazis and hunting monsters in World War II. It's black and white, pulpy with pops of color, and uh, a lot of horror and action involved with that one. So... I mean, with this newest book, why did you two make the uh, the change to all ages? So you you just came hot off the press, you know, with Nazi monsters, something definitely maybe not suited for the younger audience. But, you know, why move towards something uh, that can be read by all ages? I mean, honestly, we always wanted to do an all ages book. Um, and we I mean, I think some of the first projects we talked about working on were all ages um this is just the first one we got around to and there was uh tim i think the other thing was a lot of the all ages stories that we had in mind were were so big like so long that we never had one that felt like it was um like kind of easy to get into so when tim had the idea for this one to do it as like a closed-ended story you know we just thought it was perfect yeah i know uh we were at a con years ago and um We'd gotten a lot of kids coming up to the table and we've got a book there with like a stoner superhero so not the most kid appropriate and trying to be like oh I, I want you to read comics but i don't think this is the right one for you and um just saw there was a, a spot in the, the market for that um and it, it kind of you know clicked to us that hey we should also have an all ages book here as well um what better way to get kids into reading comics than to have one that's accessible to them especially if their parents are cool enough to take them to a convention uh so many of the books that are made in the indie scene are all for adults because we're the ones that are primarily buying them um so it was just something we always had in the back of our heads and we've we've written other projects but um like mike mentioned it takes a while to get those off the ground there's a, a financial investment that you have to make it's a time investment so having something that was close ended um you know a whole story in 28 pages is uh really accessible uh to the audience uh it was easier for us to produce and then um it's also something that like they don't have to look for that issue too uh mm -hmm. so the kid can pick this up they can get the whole story because i know as a kid reading comics um you know, back in the day before comic book shops we would get them at like the local pharmacy or you know a, a store like that a random store and I'd pick up like issue 235 and I didn't read 234 and I didn't have 236. So I got this little like snippet of a story and always kind of wondered how it started, where mm -hmm. it went after that. Uh, so just to have something that was like a closed case for them, they could read the whole story in, in one shot was, was really an important idea for us. For everyone that is watching right here is the link to check out this campaign. We're going to be pulling it up live here just in a few moments. But until then, be sure to check that out. Be sure to back... Uh, and if you can't back share it on Facebook and Twitter, word of mouth costs you absolutely nothing to do. So, I mean, we were talking a little bit about uh, about this backstage, but now that we're live, I mean, what is it? Is it hard to write for all ages compared to the other type of stories that you guys ran? I know you you mentioned previously this was something that you've always wanted to do. But now that you actually had the chance to do one, you know, in a full fleshed out story, how was that experience compared to the other two stories that you have published? Uh, we'll start with Mike on that one. Oh, um, I think the writing process is not all that different as much as like 
I mean, we've attempted some of these other type of all ages stories in the past. Uh, and I think Tim and I have always had, had like an affinity as viewers, as audiences ourselves for all ages stories, like Monster Squad and, and stuff like that. We would always come back to as like, what is it about this that we still as adults find so like appealing in this nostalgia way? So um, I think it was kind of just tapping into like, what are the stories we liked as kids? And what are the stories that like, even as adults, we can look back at and be like, oh no, that wasn't cheesy. Like, or it's, it is <laughs> cheesy, but it's cheesy in a fun way. Yeah, kind of to go back on to what we were talking about earlier too. Um, we are putting this out ourselves. We didn't have an editor to answer to or a publisher to answer to. So we could kind of set the parameters where we want it. And it's really up to the audience to, you know, accept that. Um, so with something like an all ages book, we were kind of setting up where the the line is. Okay, we're going to walk up to this line and not cross it. Um, but we didn't have anybody telling us you can't put this in there. You can't do that. Um, so that was part of it for us. And I think, you know, just watching the kind of stuff that kids read and the kids like to watch and the video games they play, you know, I think a lot of the people that are producing content for kids underestimate them. Uh, they don't uh, give them things that are on their level or take them seriously. So a big part of that um, led to us making a comic that we hoped doesn't um you know it doesn't have violence in it it's not it, there's no bad words in it so it doesn't cross a line in that sense but we hope it treats the audience with respect mm -hmm. and treats them you know gets down on their level where they are versus trying to to pitch them something that is too sugar-coated or something like that that maybe uh you know wouldn't work for that 11 year old 12 year old or maybe too horrifying too i remember uh what was the books like are you scared of the dark it had like the the clown looking monster and the stories were just horrifying as a kid and like they, those were in public libraries like <laughs> yeah exactly i feel like this is very much in line with the, with those kind of things like the goosebumps books or, mm -hmm. are you afraid of the dark all those kind of things it's it's right in line with that so um good thing for a, a new generation you know those books are pretty old now I, I, most of those were in the late 80s early 90s i think so um you know something for a new generation there so can you guys give us a little bit about what the last house on gallows hills is about now that we kind of started painting a picture of the type of story you guys are creating you know what what is the story about yeah so uh last house on gallows hill is uh, a one-shot horror comic for all ages uh and it's about um it's town where uh, a house mysteriously appears in this neighborhood. Uh, Bobby, one of the, the kids in the neighborhood, notices the house uh, and he realizes that the other adults can't see it. So he brings his friend Jack over. Jack can see it. So now they've realized the two of them can see it. Kids can see it. Other kids in the neighborhood, they start bringing them one by one. And they realize that the kids in the neighborhood can see this house, but the adults can't. They do research. They find out that this house has a long history. It burned down on this exact site on the top of the hill called gallows hill um and there's something calling to the youngest kid in the in their their neighborhood named brett um it's a, it's this ominous voice uh that seems familiar to him so he keeps being drawn to that and the other kids realize that he's gone into the house so they set up a rescue mission uh so the other four kids go in to, to rescue brett the youngest kid that's been missing inside the house and then it's sort of like a haunted house story from there that is awesome. We have our good friend Gold Lotus uh, Paper MTG. Uh, Scary Stories for Stormy Nights had some pretty disturbing books. They even had a big screen adaptation of the book series that was scary as hell. I think maybe that's the one, or the scary stories to tell at night. I just remember there had been some crazy stories. They had really, I don't even know, gruesome, grotesque art that went along with it. And it's like, dude, this is wild. So, Definitely. Um, I, you two uh, do co-collaboration on the writing you know what's that process look like for in all ages and mike um with your film history you know um what are some of the, you know the techniques we can maybe expect to see in this book um well i mean in terms of co-writing it's it's always been the same regardless of uh what what type of book it is um tim and i co-writ a web series together and we used to do film stuff that's you know how we met in college um, but I'd say technique wise, it's the thing that we come into a lot is like kind of just checking each other's work. You know, we both, we both have, you know, experience being directors and writers. And so when one of us does a draft, the other one kind of just goes like, oh, you know, I, I think the dialogue's good here, but I think we have too many panels or I think we need to, to do a better reveal on this page or sometimes it's vice versa. And like, 
everything is there in the panels, but the dialogue or the, you know, the pace just doesn't feel right. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's the best part about, I think, working with Tim for me is just like, we always kind of get to make each other stronger. Like there's never a sense of like either one of us is, um, is like, uh, at an impasse when it comes to storytelling, we're just kind of strengthening each other and refining it. So let's talk the rest of the creative team. I mean, I was telling Tim before, uh, this, the, you know, these interiors are just absolutely gorgeous. I just love the art. I mean, who's uh, the artist for this? Yeah, so uh, Lorenzo Grassi is doing all of the interior line work, and then uh, we brought in Arthur Hesley, who's one of our frequent collaborators on colors. Um, we were actually doing Grave Brigade. Arthur colors all of Grave Brigade, and we were in the middle of coloring that, and I was just so excited about the pages I was getting in, so I sent them over and just said, hey, you know, this is a project I'm working on. What do you think of this? And right away, he was like, dude, I got to be on this project. What's going on? What's the deal? Um, so I sent him a couple more pages and I was like, okay, as soon as we get this, you know, all the line work done, um, you know, bring it on. And he, he sent me a few tests and like nailed it. Absolutely knocked it out of the park. He, he knew the right tone. Uh, he was really excited about doing something that was all ages. Um, and he had the right tone and the color scheme it was perfect. Uh, brought it all to life. So super happy about that. And, um, we were also able to work with, uh, Kaylin Smith, who's, you know, an artist that I've always really admired, um, she did a book called Plume. That was her own book that she she wrote and drew, and uh, did um, a book with Source Point Press called Mother, which is I think the first book I had seen her on. So I've always kind of had that, uh, you know, in my Rolodex, going, okay, if I get the right project, maybe an all ages project, I'll reach out to her. Uh, so when this came up, I was like, I think she'd be a great fit. So she did the the variant cover that we're really happy with. She has some really awesome names for her books too. Those are such like powerful titles. I always, you know, just like the one word, like it's, it's yeah. so strong. So mm -hmm. let's go ahead and use this opportunity to swing over to Kickstarter and let's check out this campaign all together. Everyone in the chat, let me drop that link for you to check it out with us. And like I said, if you can back, we would love to see it, but simply putting this on Facebook and Twitter is hundred percent free to do and it costs nothing. And I mean, this book is awesome. It's all ages. You're, I'm guaranteeing you're going to have someone who's going to love it just as much. So. Congratulations, too, on your guys' success with the campaign. This is uh, your third oh, one. Oh, thanks. Well, we did uh, two campaigns for Superbud and then Great Brigade. That was three. So this is our fourth campaign that we've done together. So we are looking at The Last House on Gallows Hill, an all-ages horror comic, currently at $1,077 of a $800 goal. So congratulations on funding again. Uh, and Witch Starter. What, uh, what is this Witch Starter? I have no idea. Now I'm stumped. Which starter? <laughs> what is which starter? Let's see what happens when we click. <laughs> I just clicked on it too. Let's make magic. Oh, it's a open call for all magic in. Uh, oh. I was gonna I pronounce that word, but there's a little too many syllables in that one for me to give a stab. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is awesome. Well, congratulations on that. So this is Yeah, that's cool. Eight. We didn't apply for that, so they must have added that on for us. That's cool. Love this uh, cover right here. And then is this uh, the, haunt, uh, the Haunted Hill in question right here at the top? Yeah, that's it. You know, I really love the way you guys did the title too. You know, not exactly at the top. You kind of had it right here with the house. That I don't, I don't think I've ever really seen a title done this way. That was uh, Lorenzo's idea. I asked him for a couple ideas for a cover and he sketched it out and... He, you know, didn't have the, gra we didn't have the graphic yet for where the title, uh, what the title was going to look like, but he just kind of penciled it out to say, I think this is where we put it under the house. Mm -hmm. um, so a really cool idea. Right here is the variant cover. Is uh, any significant meaning with the JRK? <laughs> that was Lorenzo's idea. And I've, I've been curious. His name is Jack. Uh, so <laughs> it could be his initials. <laughs> I also think it, it always calls to mind that it's jerk. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was thinking. He jerk kind of as be well. the the jerk of, of the group, so I, I wonder if that's what it is. And right here is a look I love at when some the illustrators these. do that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. fun. It's a collaboration that way, right? And these interiors are just gorgeous as well. How did you guys feel when you started getting this artwork back and seeing your work brought to life like this? Oh yeah, man, it blew me away. I know um, I'd seen a lot of his work, but I it was like. I, taking a shot at it going i think this is gonna work for this project he had never done something that was all ages and horror before but just seeing his stuff i was like i think this is gonna be the right fit and then um 
you know, within getting like the first page back or even just the character designs, I was like, yeah, I, I feel really good about this. So was it hard to hit the beats for like, you know, a younger audience while maintaining the beats for maybe the older audience as well? What do you think there, Dean? Go ahead, Tim. I mean, I honestly, I feel like this is one of these things where it's just um, really coming back to our roots. Like Tim and I are huge Stephen King fans. Um, you know, I think we both watched Are You Afraid of the Dark as kids. We both read those scary stories to tell in the dark as kids. Uh, you know, it just kind of feels like there's inherent storytelling when it comes to a haunted house story. So like, you kind of know where you want to go with it. And it's more about just making it true to whatever story you want to tell. So um, Tim had a lot of great ideas right off the bat with this. And then, you know, we just kind of narrowed in on, on what we wanted to do with it. And also, I think, Tim, you got some good feedback from somebody about, um, about, uh, well, you fill it in. <laughs> yeah, so I reached out to uh, Leland uh, Leland Berg, who is a an, an editor. Um, so just somebody I've worked with in the past, um, and just really great uh, feedback. So I just reached out at the, the scripting point to say, "Hey, this is what Mike and I are working on. Um, you know, do you have any tips?" And he gave us uh, some good notes on a, a rough draft that we had, and uh, we had done you know several revisions um from that so that was good feedback we got and i think ultimately you're you were right dean you're talking about you know coming into it with you know having read stephen king it's a it's a lot of that and it's a lot of like steven spielberg in, in the terms of the storytelling and the pacing as well and, and you know looking at a lot of the stuff he's done with kids as an audience with um et or you know producing goonies and things like that um that, that was a big influence as well and just his overall storytelling i think he's one of the best at it um, but it is difficult more of the fact that it's a it's a one shot versus just the fact that it's mm -hmm. an all ages thing I think uh, trying to do that kind of storytelling in a compact way to get to a beginning middle and end in 20 some pages was difficult um, so this one went from 24 to 26 to 28 pages just as we kept going okay well we need to, to put this in there this feels rushed let's slow down the pace let's add you know a splash here and see if we can slow down the pace and um, we need a little bit more room for dialogue to, to you know, for exposition, things like that. One thing I, I, I really love just off the rip, like right here, you have uh, the postman walking question mark explanation. Cause he doesn't see the house. So like knowing that adults can't see it, it's like, this is just a subtle, but perfect touch. And it's, you know, it's like it, you just, if you're paying attention, you know, you're going to, you're going to find some goodies within this. I appreciate you noticing that. And that's one of those things that like an artist can do for you. Cause that's not in the script. You know, I just, the script says something like the postman walks by and doesn't see that doesn't see the house but he gets that all across with that one panel so we don't have to waste any more time in dialogue explaining that so was it hard fleshing out you know a cast of characters like this for the story I, you, you said there was a lot of pressure with it being a one shot i mean uh just knowing what i know about script writing uh, that that just seems like it would be a pretty big task within itself yeah well you know i think we we always start with thinking about what is the plot and then what characters would help that plot move um, and what would be the conflict that they might need. Uh, so we use that to, to create the characters. Um, so there's, there's some roadblocks on their, on their path. Um, the characters don't always get along those kind of mm -hmm. things. And, you know, I, I think it starts out in, in broad strokes and a little bit of, um, you know, being a little bit more generic or stereotypes of those characters. And then you can refine it from there. Um, and as you get like, the, the core story down then you're going into a revision and then we can kind of finesse it from there and give them a little bit more depth as characters um but again with with 28 pages it has to move fast so we have to get the yep. audience caught up quickly to what their rapport is like so that we can just move on to the plot and i really like the aesthetics of the house once they're in like just how run down and just rugged it looks it almost feels like a whole different like feeling um just this panel in particular just compared to them outside of the house like the palette itself just feels a lot darker and grimmer definitely and that's why it was important for us to to include that on the kickstarter page so people can kind of see that you know i think in the the rough draft it's or not the rough draft but the, the first draft of building the kickstarter um it was just the stuff before that because it was almost a tease but then we wanted to make sure the audience can see a little bit of what's going on inside there without giving it away you know, it is tough with a, a one shot story. You don't want to give mm -hmm. away the whole ending set is the whole thing, but um, to have enough that really does hook the audience, hopefully. And then uh, potential 
glimpse at maybe the baddie of the story. Um, Mike, you want to give us maybe a little bit about what this guy's about without spoiling too much? I mean, it's a little tough without spoiling too much, so <laughs> I'm going to be very brief. <laughs> but um, it is, you know, representative of this sort of evil from the house, and it has this... Um, quality that can sort of get into your mind and see the things that you are potentially afraid of Ooh, ooh. i mean I, I i know you said this was a one shot but it feels like there's so much potential for something to spin off of this like the way you guys constructed this story just seems like there's so much you could do with this well, that is the beauty of storytelling, you know. If um, <laughs> there is suddenly a demand of it, we could um, we could spin it out and do and do more. Uh, but it's it's important for us to make sure that the audience feels like it's not a cliffhanger, that they do feel like there is some satis satisfaction in reading it. Um, but yeah, I think there's always an opportunity for other ones. Um, and I think this specific combination of genre to do horror and all ages is something that uh, I would love to, to go back to. And I know Dean and I have talked about that before. So there probably will be something in, in, in this world or, or similar that we will co come back and to. And going live, what, two days before, uh, it, did you go live, what, the 11th? The 11th, yeah. Yeah, so two days before Friday the 13th is like the perfect time to do mm -hmm. it. Um, let's take a look at these rewards. Everyone watching right here is the link to take a look with us. We have the digital coming in at six bucks, a physical copy of cover A at 12, cover B uh, with the print um, at 18, and then you can get cover A and B at $28, a hardcover edition at 50, uh, then you can get the trio for 75 awesome rewards there sweet to the point this hardcover looks gorgeous too thank you yeah that was something we we came up with with grave brigade and uh really excited to offer something to our backers that um you know we kind of talked about before that it can really stand on your shelf it's it's a piece that can be a conversation piece it's something you can have out it can be a coffee table book it's not something that you know like a floppy goes in a box and, and gets filed away and forgotten um something that kind of sits there um the, the person can have an emotional connection to and really really hold on to uh, so we were really excited to, to find a printer that would do that and durable for kids of course right i mean you can again, only bend the cover absolutely. of a floppy so many times before it crinkles up absolutely perfect for that as well awesome 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 so guys once again there is the link check it out with us uh now you two have been on the show before you know the drill we'll start with mike um for anyone who might be on the fence about backing what would you like to say to them to kind of push them over that hump and get get them to back this book you know i think the big thing and i'm I'm not even gonna try to convince anyone, but I'll just say that ever since we announced we were doing this, I've had so many friends of mine who have kids reach out and just say how excited they are for it because <laughs> they're all fans of our adult comics. And I think they've all been waiting for a chance to share our writing with their kids or to be mm -hmm. able to have an opportunity to, to have a story for their kids that they feel connected to also. So I'd say that's that's my big sell. And uh, Tim, what about you? Yeah, you know, I think it is a fun book. Uh, again, like we talked about, it's something you can get the beginning, middle, and end in this one shot. You don't have to wait a year for the next Kickstarter to, to read to see what happened to your favorite characters. You get it all here in one shot. And uh, much like Mike, you know, that's the thing I'm most excited about is sharing it with a younger audience. Um, getting kids excited about books just the way Mike and I were growing up, you know, um, been reading comics all our lives. And it's, it's awesome to pass it on and, and maybe be that... Um, that role for, for that next generation reading mm -hmm. comic give them something that they're really excited about that's what's got me excited um my kids will be old enough pretty soon they might be reading this book in a couple of years so that's a really cool thing as well to have a book that that they can appreciate as well it's always so sad how fast they grow it, it you never really realize it until you step back i mean because the days that's go right. by and it feels you know it feels like 24 hours but then you know a week or two goes by you take a picture and you notice their hair is longer they're taller it's like man it's it's fleeting ever ever so fastly so that being said it is time for us to begin wrapping up this podcast before we do that though uh we ask you know a little bit of advice and then what you guys are consuming outside of creating so for anyone who might be interested in teaming up with someone and doing a co-collaboration you know where they're co-writing or sharing any part of the process what would be some of the biggest do's and don'ts you guys might be able to offer or suggest uh, to help maybe someone listening 
Um, just real quick, I would say uh, make sure that you know what you want and you communicate that, um, you know, have that in writing, whether it's a contract or just in terms. So that way there's nothing left up to interpretation or uh, mis misunderstood. Um, that's really important when working with a collaborator. Um, I think for me as a, a, a script writer and a comic writer, um, getting to what my intention is with every scene is really important. So not just describing how I see it, but what is important in each scene or each beat is really important to convey to the, to the uh, artist that's drawing it for us, um, since we don't draw our, our own books, just though that way they know what the most important thing is that they should be focused on. And they, they can see what they can maybe cut or adjust, but they know what the focus is. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Tim said. Um, and I would say, uh, think long term, like actually outline what the next three months, six months, 12 months looks like when you're doing a project like this, or any creative project, because it's very easy to get excited in the moment. And, mm -hmm. you know, for the day or for the week, but a lot of these, these projects take, you know, months of work some great advice there i appreciate that now outside of creating what are you guys consuming you know video games movies books uh films i uh, you both you know have experience in the film industry i mean was there any, any uh movies that stood out to you uh since we've last had you on i i don't know if i've gotten to see a lot of movies lately unfortunately um but I just started the uh, fall of the House of Usher, being that it's a uh, spooky month um, on Netflix, which is the new um, Matt Flanagan horror series the guy who did House on Haunting Hill. And uh, I'm currently listening to the audiobook uh, Holly by Stephen King, which is a okay. continuation of some of his previous stories. You know, I heard we're supposed to get a Netflix series on the 13 Ghosts. You guys remember the, uh, that movie? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the series is supposed to like um, go through each ghost. I, I don't know how true it is, but I thought that would be awesome. I mean, that that movie is like a classic. It feels like. I think it's so I great that Matt Lillard comes back. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Tim, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's awesome that people can uh, take these movies and things and just expand on them with like streaming and do like multiple episodes like that kind of episodic storytelling is a really great way to get to, to the characters better to, to drive the plot a little bit longer. Uh, it's better than I think an hour and a half in a movie. I literally, you know, during my free time, will listen to podcast breakdown of like lore, like Star Wars lore, whatever lore there is, like where they'll read the books, they'll go into the expanded universe and just break down individual like this is why Anakin is this way and this is why he turned into this way and about everything. It's like so addicting. So I, yeah, I'm all about that. Um, but what are you consuming Tim outside of creating? Yeah. Good. Um, so I'm kind of behind the times, but I, I just read the six gun. Um, that was awesome. That's a Cullen Bunn book from maybe 10 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's out there in the world. Uh, you can get the volume one for pretty cheap. Um, that was like, this is delightful. It really it blew me away at how awesome that was to read. Um, and then on Friday, I just got a copy of a book called I hate you, please die. That was a Kickstarter book. It was awesome. I definitely recommend that. I don't know if uh, it's available yet because uh, it was through Kickstarter, but uh, check it out. That was like uh, Garrett Gunn that did that. Um, that was really cool. It blew me away with how good it was. That is awesome. Definitely going to have to check out those titles as well. I uh, mostly have just been hyped for the new Spider-Man game dropping. I'm a little bit of a gamer myself, so I'm hoping to pick that up day one and uh, be streaming that live when we get the chance to. But outside of that, I... no time for TV, books, or anything, it feels like. Just work, work, work. Yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> I would love to play that game when it comes out. And actually, the, the only other thing I would plug is uh, Tim was nice enough to loan me night of the ghoul by scott snyder and i okay. loved it and read it as quick as i could <laughs> yeah that so one was awesome so everyone watching right here is a link to check out that kickstarter and as always if you can't back i mean it's just a few bucks to get the digital you have that's you know don't go to mcdonald's for one day get this book it's going to be worth it um <laughs> but if you can't just share it wherever you can word of mouth is 100 percent free it is time for us to wrap up i hope you all have a lovely monday but most importantly guys keep it geekly <laughs>